Let's make planning this year's garden a lot easier with the Planter app. This app is packed full of features. It has companion and combative planting, which are indicated by green and red circles. It has a simple drag and drop interface. It has 80 plus plants and thousands of varieties. All the info is needed to grow veggies, including when to start seeds, transplant and harvest, the ability to create custom plants and varieties, a growing guide with in-depth articles to supplement the quick info in the app, not to mention that you can view it and use it both on your PC and on your mobile device, so you can always be planting your garden on the go. This app is used in my garden year-round to plan the upcoming seasons, reference the last year's seasons so I know when to rotate, and it also helps me to learn more about companion planting using the visual cues. When you create your garden, it's going to be based on the dimensions and each block is going to be a square foot. I've had a lot of fun using this app and the Planter app, which is spelled P-L-A-N-T-E-R, is available in your app store on both Google and Apple. So what are you waiting for? Get out there and plan your garden and use the link below to get a discount on the Planter app. To have a good harvest, one must plant good seeds and must also use the right kind of fertilizer. The carrots have grown large and firm. How good they will taste. Well, everybody, I'm sure you've seen them in your garden at this point. It's now summer, it's hot, and the bugs are hungry. So, I've got pests in my garden. Batavia, she probably doesn't because her garden's immaculate. Mm-hmm. Is that true? True statement? Absolutely, it's true. <laughs> You're so wrong about that, but um, no. Well, why don't you go ahead and say it? Well, we're not going to cover off on these kind of okay. things, though. So I had animals in my backyard. In addition to the birds that with all of my structures that perch around and the neighborhood stray cats, then the you know kind of colony of squirrels, I have had a recent visit daytime visit mind you of yeah. a raccoon and that's kind of all i want to say about that because i'm still totally freaked well, out what was he doing in your garden helping me plant flowers maybe he was, like, i walking don't know around while you were like, working in the garden i was i'll send you the video i was in the garden six o'clock in the morning looking back at the footage <laughs> i could see that he came from underneath the fence and started walking. A lot of people call them gangways. I didn't say the side of the house. And so I caught the, him out of the side. And look, I don't want to talk about yeah. it, but let me tell you about it. I caught him out of the corner of my eye and screamed. <laughs> and it, but it shows him. <laughs> look, shows him startled. But, you know, I thought that that would let, like, he'd find his way out based on that. But he did this weird thing, like, climbed up on the banister and started, like, eating the sweet potato. Or not the sweet potato, because I know those are yummy. The potato plants that are sitting in a container. It was a whole deal. Like, there should be, by the time this airs, there should be a video on Be Better Garden that captures the Blair Witch-like shaky camera footage. Because <laughs> I was filming that morning. You know, so it's a whole it's a whole to-do. I got back on the horse. I came out the next morning. He's not going to run me out of my garden. Well, I didn't come out at six, though. I came out a little bit later. What time did you come out? So, yeah. What time did you come out? I, about uh, 10, 10, 30 to 7. Like, I'm normally out, like, about 5.15 or... Wait, I'm normally out about 5.15, 5.30. Uh, that day, I had been out there that long. He appeared at 6.15. The next day, I came out at 7. Like, I'm trying to give him a little bit of room here. So, no, well, first of all, I don't support you giving him any room. I think you need to run his ass out. Um do you want me mm-hmm. to tell you something I learned about raccoons? I know we're not talking about mammals in the garden, but we can. No, because I want to be in a pre- I want to be in a pretend world. I want to pretend like they're not geniuses. I want to pretend like they're not going to pick the lock for my house and come inside. Like I want to pretend like all of that is. Oh the no truth. no no no! This is like how so. to keep them away. Mm-hmm. It's just okay. play an AM radio for them. Apparently, the sound of people's <laughs> voices like they'll think that there's actually people there. And for a while, they'll stay away and you might be able to change their routine. So we've been trying that out with our chicken coop because, you know, we've got a lot of raccoons. And um, yeah, so far it's working. So I actually had the thought of playing music. I normally have my earbuds in. And so I said, you know, maybe I'll play music. I'm going to tell you, I have great neighbors, but not one 
came out with all of my bamming and yelling. And so, you know, at the next neighborhood watch meeting, I'm going to have a talk with some of them. So I think what we should do is you should play Backyard Gardens podcast on repeat form. And then when this <laughs> message comes up, he'll know, Mr. Raccoon, leave the garden. And that's it. Mm-hmm. So Let's it's pest. I mean, it's it's an uphill battle every season. And for me, it's like ramping up as we speak. So I was just out there, like looking at my leaves, like identifying what's been chewing on them and stuff like that. So mm-hmm. this should be a good one. I hope. Yeah, well, these it's normally my least favorite topic, but I have for right in this moment, a different perspective. And I can't guarantee it's going to last throughout the season. But when you go to war with a raccoon, you see how it's going to get amped up every time. When you're wrestling a raccoon, you're, uh, no, in all seriousness, uh, I have prior to that and then since then, like, it's just, they're a lot worse out there than what's in my garden, you know, pest wise, bug wise. Um, and so I've had frustrations all spring. Um, and I know that I'm not even at the worst part of it yet. Right, like as of our recording, um, but I know it. They're coming. I know the rest. They're of them gonna make it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Your look of disgust says it all. So I mean, right mm-hmm. now, like uh, the, sh- the short list of what I'm dealing with, um, and this is just the beginning: is grasshoppers, Japanese beetles, squash bugs, squash vine borers, um, possibly flea beetles at this point. And I think that's it for right now. So that's four that I'm dealing with right now. Maybe five. I lost count. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So we're like keeping an eye out on them, trying to treat for them and all that stuff. And it's tough. So um, I th- think what, what are you dealing with right now? Well, I was just going to say that you're like vegetable type wise like easily a month yeah. ahead of me meaning like how your vegetables have matured so a lot of what you've described maybe half of them are specific excuse me plant type right you know so i don't have a lot of leaves on my my squash yet right not to say that the vine borer won't attack you know um, i haven't looked up when he comes to my area so all in all i have probably lost about 15 seedlings of various varieties, um, the various plant types to quite literally roly polies, peel yeah. bugs. It has been one of the most frustrating bits of spring. And while I've been gardening a bunch of years, spring gardening, I think this is like the fourth year that I've like made a real effort at it. And every plan that I made has been, there's been some interruption to it. Now this is, compounded because a bunch of other things went wrong with my planning for spring. So I like was really shaking the dice and hoping that things would be in my favor. So to have to start over with some of these seedlings have been tough, Um, but I'm trying to get to the other side of it. What I expect to see in a matter of days, if not hours, if not minutes are going to be Japanese beetles. Uh, So they're, they're flying in. (laughs) I know you don't feel like it's a big deal. I say this every time we talk about this, but aphids, I have been so fortunate with my kale so far. It's just not been hot enough. I think it's, which there may not be a direct correlation. Our spring has been so cool, so dry, Um, but aphids have not even entered my garden, you know, notably. Um, And, and yeah, that's it. I don't, I'm not claiming any other bugs. Oh, okay. Yeah. Squash vine borer. I got, I actually have, you won't believe I've turned into this person. I have squash plants undercover. Now I cover plants, but I I really don't like covering squash because I really am not feeling the whole self pollination thing, which ultimately is coming. Yeah, that's 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 a huge pain in the butt. Now Mm -hmm. tomorrow morning you wake up, boom, you're gonna see aphids. Now that you said that, they're right there. I could. Yeah, you can hear them all marching to the van. Yeah. Oh, wait, I did the, how could I miss the biggest threat to my garden? The cabbage moth, um, which I'm not joking, is like flying up on my window now on the second floor, no less. Um, Going back to the beginning of May, 
she had attacked. And I spent probably about 10 days picking uh, cabbage worms. But in this moment, I have it under control. And that's probably the one that's more challenging for me because a squash vine borer has a, a clock. Right, you know, roly polies are going to be forever in my garden, but I can manage that a little bit better just based on some techniques. But the cabbage moth, as long as I'm growing, she's out, right? And so everything's under control now. But as soon as I leave something uncovered, she's yeah. Back. I mean that is true. It, I don't know. I don't even want to talk about squash farm borer right now, but I will. This is like the the episode that neither one of us really look forward to doing, but it's kind of like an obligation because pests, yeah. I was just doing, I just recorded a video about this. There's a lot of problems with pests and um, the problem obviously is that they eat the leaves, but the way they affect the plant is the plant will grow, the leaves will get eaten. And so instead of the plant producing what you're going to harvest, it's trying to recuperate and build up strength constantly. Mm -hmm. It's always trying to build, 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 build. So the trick is, and there's multiple ways, and we're definitely going to get into this, is to eliminate the pests, but then get the growth back to where it was. And I, I think the ultimate problem is being responsible about it, too. You know what I mean? And there's multiple ways to look at it. So just if you're new to the show and you've never listened to us before, welcome. And just for FYI, um, Batavia does not use anything organic or not organic in her garden as far as like sprays. I use organic Mm -hmm. sprays in my garden and I am not above, even though I don't, I don't think I've ever really done it, it. I'm not above using non-organic sprays in my garden but i just haven't gotten around to it and now that we've gotten bees in our yard we're not really going to be doing that we're going to be focusing as we have been on the organic treatments but there are methods to use this and correct treatments to use it and i used to be under the school of thought until about maybe four years ago that you use one treatment for one season, one treatment for the next, and now I'm finding that I'm bleeding them over more and more. So there's going to be a lot of that. Um, where, which one do you want to start with? What's we, I've, We've done cabbage moth before. Uh, I want to talk about, and this is probably generally, it applies to multiple plants. I, my experience this year it was with the roly-polies, but I want to talk a little bit more about the recovery that a plant goes okay. through. Right. You know, so um, and sometimes the decision that sorry, I'm looking out my window, trying to stay in front of the mic, the decision that the gardener has to make. Right. Sacrifice. Uh, So I have um, this was beans, Uh pole beans and cabbage were the impacted plants. So you see the bugs. Right. You try to curb their eating. Right. You think generally you're successful. I find that. With some pest, if a plant is mature, so if you have trouble with seedlings making it to some level of maturity because of pest pressure, if you can get a strong seedling planted or if the plant can survive until it has three or four or five, six true leaves, um, then you may be out of the woods. Um, But what I found with uh, my beans were, and this goes from like me moving where I want to plant them even. I've just changed my garden plan based on some pest pest pressure. Um, I thought I was out of the woods. I had really true leaves, but I didn't pay close enough attention because the stem had been nodded. Right. And so I came in and looked at one or two plants and it's like, oh, the stem is collapsing. And that's it's game over when it comes to that. Right. And so I pulled it out. You know, luckily, I actually had some beans on the other side of that bed and hopefully they will. It looks like they're making it. Um, But that's the bit of like, you know, being careful about when you're thinking you're out of the woods. The other side of it is the, the cabbage. Um, which again, you'd be so proud of me, be prepared to be proud of me. This is probably three weeks ago. Now I pulled, I think I had six green cabbage or white cabbage in my garden this year. I pulled two of them. Like the plant was obviously sick. You know, it probably, if I gave it a shot of like fertilizer, nitrogen, it may have greened up a bit more, but you can tell it was very peaked. It was riddled with holes and, to be quite frank, I just didn't want to babysit those right. two anymore. 
And so I said, all right, you know, four cabbage, if I make it is enough for me. Um, so, I mean, I think sometimes it isn't about, you know, the plant surviving. Sometimes you just have to make the tough decision. Like yeah. Hard stop. I mean, so first of all, when the, when the stem collapses, that's not exactly the end. doesn't have to be. It can be a major mm, setback, okay. but um, for instance, I went out and I cut my um, kale, and I just yeah, I, knew yeah, you were I say cut kale. the whole thing of kale and it's leafing back. You know, um, I do it all the time with like my trees and stuff, my little baby trees and pots. I cut them, to no leaves on them at all, and they resprout. So it's definitely possible that it would resprout because you still have a good root system, right? As long as nothing's affecting the roots. Well, no. No, you don't, though. So in the kale example, I to- totally agree, right? You know, you think about how a plant goes dormant in the winter and then, you know, what happens next spring? You get leaves, right? Everything that was on top of yeah. it was dead. You know, how does it happen? Yeah, absolutely. Great root system. I'm talking about being plants that have like, you know, two oh, true yeah, leaves, no, no. right? So they're being this uh, root system is still fragile. The Stem is not even a pencil yeah, no, size yet. That's done. You know, and so yeah. Um, so I mean, again, it, it depends. It's um, you know, there are not a lot of things. And if I'm really honest, I actually transplanted those beans too, which you know generally isn't recommended for beans, right? So it had already had to survive transplant yep. shock, right? You know, then I sat it in a place that had some you know pest pressure. And it was like survival of the fittest. And these plants didn't, these couple didn't make it. And it probably is going to be better in the long run. Now, the other ones that I ended up growing, I transplanted two of the other ones that are growing on this trellis. Those are much larger transplants, though. Again, it's generally not recommended to transplant beans, although people do it. Um, and so far, it looks like I'm having success with uh, just some regular like Kentucky Wonder beans or yeah, something. Yeah, I mean... Th- So the thing is, too, and there's a whole lot of stuff in this one thing is one. It's like, you know, with beans, like you can pop them in the ground and they'll sprout fast. So that's one benefit of that. You know, you're going to get growth no matter what. Um, So there's that. And then, you know, you'd mentioned giving them some fertilizer. So obviously, like with your beans, the cabbage, yeah, you pulled them, but the cabbage, stuff like that. Um, you know, if you're getting a lot of damage and you feel like you can save the plant and when I, I mean, when you say you feel like you can save the plant, I think you got to be able to make a decision. You know, if you remove the pest, you start treating it. I mean, you have to look at it too. Treating the pest is not just like a one-time thing. It's a multiple week procedure. Mm -hmm. So the key Mm -hmm, is mm -hmm. finding these things early and fast. So if you do that and you get these things and you take care of them, and you want to start bringing it back at the same time, like what I like to do is at my second treatment, I'll fertilize. And so what that does is that'll make it outgrow the damage. It'll push the growth to it. So Mm -hmm. you can do stuff like that. Now, I would not use something like a granular fertilizer, an organic fertilizer that's going to take multiple mm-hmm, weeks mm-hmm. to break down and then kick in. Yeah. You, I would use something like a fish fertilizer, and we're going to keep it organic for this conversation, um, a fish fertilizer, a liquid fertilizer mm-hmm. that basically, as soon mm-hmm. as it hits the roots, that plant's fed and it's going to start growing, yeah. you know, and not to mention with these fertilizers that I just mentioned, like um, the, it's really hard to over feed that with them so that's mm-hmm, another mm-hmm. benefit because the level of it's it's diluted yeah. at so let me take a step back let me walk you through transplants were healthy for the cabbage that went in in april they were uncovered which i'm going to make the balance between treating it with you know some uh, purchase spray versus using cover as a um, a proactive step so planted them out did not put any cover on so they're out in the wild they're out in the open i think i felt like i saw the first cabbage worm eating one of the four plants that are in the one bed and i picked it and kept moving i know better right so in that moment i could have treated with you know bt as an example all of those plants right again let me get in front of the attack but i didn't i could have covered all of those plants and then checked daily for worms and picked them. I didn't, right? You know, so in my mind, maybe I thought, all right, this is going to be the sacrificial plant, this one collard. 
or excuse me, one cabbage. And you know what happened? It moved to yeah. the second and the third, right? And so again, I still had plenty of time. The plant still looked good. I still had plenty of time and I didn't treat, right? You know, so these plants now are probably, uh, they're, they're about six weeks planted. So if I, I'm going to say right at the beginning of June, I came in and said, let me cover them. But there is so much damage here. And now the, um, the plant goes through this weird bit of like, you know, it looks like it's trying to form a head. There's so few leaves on it. Like there's some level of plant confusion here. And so I basically looked and said the survival of the fittest, which ones are the best here, you know? And so it put me in a situation where they were all undercover. You know, I made the adjustment and now two of those four look really good and healthy. I got it under control, but I created all of that in saying I didn't take the steps I normally take from the very beginning. And then when I saw damage, I was, it was a very lackluster effort to try to get it under control. Yeah. Well, I mean, and the other thing too is the damage can occur really fast. I mean, as soon as you see one, you've got eggs on your plants, mm-hmm. but that, I don't think that necessarily yep. means like the first thing you need to do is like grab your spray bottle and get to treating. I mean, like, you, you know, you pick that first one off and I can't say this enough. Hand picking is the number one way to get mm-hmm. it under control, people. Number mm-hmm. one way because you're essentially immediately removing reproducing adults from that plant. I mean, I was just out there picking Japanese beetles off and they I mean, they're humping. They're having a damn orgy. I had six pairs on there just getting it on. So, you know, as soon as I pulled them off, they're not pr- reproducing on that plant anymore. And yep. that's really important. Mm-hmm. And I know it's gross and I know it's icky, but that's just part of it, you know? Um, yeah, I think your point about the removing the reproducers, I, I think that that's really important. Have you, when you go through these, like in all of these bugs, you see really small ones and yep. then you see really big ones. Anytime I see a big ass cabbage worm, I'm just like, gosh, have I been late to this? Because it is getting fat and fed well. Um, but it, important to note, because I live by hand picking, right? You know, so I'm a firm believer in it. But that's basically getting under control what's now past damage. Yeah. Right. Like that thing has already occurred. Like if I get all of the, the worms off in these next days, I still am out in the open if I don't spray or if I don't cover. So the cabbage moth is not gone in that example, you know. No, but if you look at the, um, uh, what's it called? The tomato hornworm, once you pick it off, you mm-hmm. basically got it under control. You just need to go out and pick all yeah, of them off, example. you know? So, like, each yep. one is mm-hmm. different, you know? And I firmly mm-hmm. believe that if you are diligent, you can get under Japanese beetles under control by hand picking alone. I do firmly I, believe I mean, that. I do um, a couple of things. You recommended the Japanese beetle trap, and I've not used it every year, but the years I have used it, you know, I've been, you know, <laughs> getting rid of a lot of Japanese beetles. But I hand pick every morning. They haven't arrived in my garden as of this recording, but when they do, they're going to eat my hibiscus leaves. They're going to eat my. Um, my okra leaves you know same family um and they are going to come fast and furious but i absolutely handpick them and i have in the past kept the damage under control because what happens and like the green beans are notorious for getting hit by them Mm, so and they always go up to the tippy top and so i went out there one year and i mean they were decimated at the top i got them under control in about a week i mean i went out there morning Mm -hmm. and night and i picked every single one i can get my hands on and by the time i was done they had started releafing in about a week and growing and you could never even Mm -hmm. tell there was any damage now that plant had been set back because it had to do Mm -hmm. that but i was able to come back and reproduce and stuff like that so um you know a lot of times it's important for people to remember that like you can't just replant a plant You know, it takes time and you have a limited amount of time Mm -hmm. to do it. So that's why some people go to these drastic measures. That's why I spray and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, getting that, you know, hand picking. I don't think there is a a pest in my garden. Actually, I never want to take that back. There's not many pests in my garden that I do not start with hand picking. Now, I was just talking about flea beetles earlier. 
I can't handpick flea beetles. There's way too many of them. Mm-hmm. But then I can mm-hmm. get into the treatments form, you know, and squirting them with some neem oil will really help, you know. Um, mm-hmm. And basically, one thing I do want to say before we get into any of these treatments, and especially neem oil, is you have to get or you don't get the ready made neem oil. Get cold pressed neem oil. Neem oil. Because what it is, is if it's below like 70 degrees, it's basically a brick. And as it warms up, it'll turn into the liquid. But you also have to put dish soap in it because it's an oil and the dish soap, it's, it's like putting oil and water. It doesn't mix. But when you put the dish soap in it, yeah. it'll bind to it and cause little bubbles and you can get it out onto your garden. So you, you've got to learn how to use this stuff. That's first and foremost. Mm-hmm. And the other thing too is like, with your, you know, Japanese beetles or anything, you got to learn the life cycle of them. And generally speaking, they're about seven to 10 day life cycle. So like right now I'm in a bad spot. I've got about a week of on and off rain showers coming through. I've got Japanese beetles just munching on everything. I've got squash vine borers trying to come out and I've got squash bugs that are just now really wreaking havoc, but I can't really get out there and spray because it basically throwing my money away. You know what I mean? So what can I do? I can go out there and get yeah. the hand picking, you know, and that's going to help start. And I'll, I mean, I'm yeah. going to try and go out like I'll look and make sure it's, if it's not going to rain tonight, I'll try and get something on there. But for the most part, like you can't do it when it's going to rain the next day or when you're going to water overhead water or yeah. something like that. So it's real. The. Um, go ahead. I was trying to come in. Yeah. So the life cycle of each individual um, you know, pest, but then is this something that's in your area for a limited amount of time? So Mr. Google says, um, and I, this first came up from Maryland. So shout out to anyone that's in Maryland, um, Japanese beetles emerge in July and kind of wrap up in yeah. August as an example. So I did the search for Illinois, you know, and they, again, kind of, it's, they start to come out towards the end of June, which tracks, Right. You know, and then you'll see them through July. Right. So, again, it's a somewhere around a six to eight week period, depending on where you are. Um, but then in September, I won't have any signs of Japanese. Yeah, you beetles. just got to weather the you storm. Know, I didn't have any signs of them in my area. Yeah. And in, in April. So there is that balance of now the plants that they like, like to grow in the yeah. times that they <laughs> visit your garden. So there is that. Uh, but don't think that it's, you know, all a wash, you know, weathering the storm is exactly what you need to do. I mean, if you want to grow these I things. Came out, I think this is about a week ago. I saw my first Japanese beetle. I go out there two days later and the top of my plants are decimated. You know, it's just really fast. And so the best thing is identifying that you have an issue. You know, look for marks on the leaves, look for mm-hmm. plant decline and stuff like that. And then that'll be able to tell you. Because another thing that a lot of people don't say or don't know or tell you is that when you have pests chewing on your plants, it can also introduce disease because it's just, it's an open Mm -hmm. wound, Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Open wound. It's weakening, weakening the plant, right. You know, making it susceptible to, you know, other attacks, Um, you know, and, and again, it's, this isn't a disease episode, but we know that in some cases, disease is directly tied to weather. White flies are one that I forgot. And it was only, I forgot it because I'm begrudging this episode because, you know, I hate talking about all of these things at once. I can like, I can only take so many pests at a time, but white flies and, you know, intuitively I knew this, but Mr. Google says white flies develop in warm weather, right? You know, so it makes sense why I started to see them in August. That's when things heat up for us, right? You know, July, August, and they normally appear on the underside of leaves. So if you're not paying close attention, you know, you could have a whole neighborhood of them on your leaves, right? You know, they, they attack my beloved collards. Like, is there no justice? (laughs) Um, So for me, you know, so a common treatment, it would be neem oil, right? And I'd say the mixture that you described, Um, I do a lot of spraying with the water hose, right? So what I'm not paying for in, in product to spray, I'm paying for my water bill, but you know, they are one of those weak, soft body creatures that 
can't survive, but because there's so many of them, it takes some time to get them under control. Well, and the thing um, too is the soft bodied insects, a lot of times just spraying like a combination of water and dish soap will kill them because it's a desiccating, mm-hmm. it dries them out. So that's like, yeah. I mean, right there, you know what I mean? And so when that's why I always say that like aphids aren't a big deal because I just spray them with I, mm-hmm. most of the time it's just dish soap and it goes away. Like I have a bottle that I leave. I'm actually out. I'm glad I said that. I need to get more. I have it just sitting on my table outside and I just put a glug mm-hmm. in and it makes a big difference. Not to mention it also lubricates the seals inside of your sprayer so they last longer. Just saying. Yeah, oh, okay. that's a important. Now I do use. I will. I will use a um, a water and yeah. dish soap spray. You know, so yeah, I will do that. Um, and you know, there's nothing organic about dish soap, but that's okay. Um, well, most dish soap. Uh, so I definitely do that as we get later into the season because aphids do. I I grow a lot of leaves. Like you know, most plants have leaves, but I grow a lot of leaves. Leaves that I plant on eating. Edible leaves, yeah. Yeah. So you know that that's important to me that I'm keeping them in pretty good condition. Um, there is also something that you know maybe not maybe it doesn't come to top of mind but gosh batavia harvest the vegetables harvest the vegetables right so it's not going to eliminate pests but if you're leaving things in your garden you know if they're not there you have less of a chance for them to be damaged by whatever these pests are and whatever damage they're doing um this is also when it comes to some of the leafy greens that i grow like get these greens when they're they're good and young and healthy you know um some of these plants also when it comes to um you know lack of airflow i know you're huge on that in your garden um so obviously again that impacts disease i'm glad you as well. said your garden you after know? that <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Lack of airflow. No, yeah. you said you're huge. Uh, but it I was also, like, you better keep going. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> oh, never, ever, ever would I ever. Uh, and so, but it, it doesn't help when you have like a bunch of bugs clustered and you have an overgrown plant, no. you know? So these are things that the gardener can do to help. I mean, you're not going to eradicate all bugs, all bad bugs from your garden. Ain't going to happen, Captain. I don't believe you. Nope. No, you're not. Mm-mm. You're absolutely nope. if not. You're saying, if you're at home saying it, if you're in the car, no. if you're in your bike listening, nope, don't believe you. Come to my garden and no, prove it and to if me. You, <laughs> I mean, I don't usually, would. I normally would not pick an argument with anybody over something. But if you come to me and you're like, I don't have pests, I'd be like, well, then you ain't looking at your garden. End of story. Like, you got them. <laughs> you may not have them bad, <laughs> but they're there somewhere. Um, now we'll say there's a lot there too, because harvesting, there's a reason why there's a saying called harvest early and often. And so Mm -hmm. when we talk about overall plant health, you got to think about the plant. And I've said this a million times and I'm gonna keep saying a million more is its job is to reproduce, right? That's, Mm -hmm. it's not to feed you. It's not for anything else. It's not to look at and be pretty and have photos put on Instagram and Facebook and stuff. That's not it. So it's going to produce when you leave your <clears throat> harvest on, when you leave the fruits or the vegetables, whatever you want to call them, on the plant, it slows down the plant, right? So it's not mm-hmm. focusing on more growth in general. It's now putting all of its energy into that piece of produce that you're going to harvest so when we pull it off like right now i've got some peppers and i've I've been debating this for a while is go ahead and pull them before they turn red let them turn red in the house you know Mm -hmm. um see how that works because then what i can do is it'll tell that plant wait i didn't get my seed yet so i'm gonna keep growing and it's gonna push more growth so you're gonna have bigger bushier plants then you put on top of it that you've got pests eating on it so you're taking that off so it's one less thing for the plant to work because if you think about it the plant kingdom is a really fascinating place because it's got to deal with the ground the air the light the water the pressure reproducing all this stuff it's super fascinating and it doesn't communicate at all 
It doesn't say, Mm -hmm. hey, Batavia, how are you doing? Today, my roots are suffering from a calcium deficiency, and I have flea beetles. (laughs) And by the way, that plant over there, just so you know, has got Japanese beetles. It doesn't do that. So it's super fascinating, which is why I love gardening so much, everybody, um, that (laughs) you can, it can handle this, but we can step in and start to eliminate problems and ease the pressure on our plants. You know, it's just like the whole Mm -hmm. idea of pulling the first flowers off the plant. You know, off peppers because yep. it'll help them focus on growing bigger roots for more plants. So there's all these things and steps that we can take, but they all kind of snowball together. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, so again, impact that a gardener can have. And I'll just, and I'm going to say this, and gosh, please don't have Ben make me do an episode on this, but. Yeah, you know, rotten plants <laughs> is a playground for disease, but it's also a playground for pests. You know, maybe not all of them, but some of them look around and say, hold on. It's also hold a on. playground we, for we got- depression. Because you're just looking at a bunch of dead oh, yeah. ass plants in your garden. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, no, not even it may not be all. It could be some. It could be rotten uh, rotten peppers on a plant, you know, like all of these things that uh, can call out to some of these pests and say, hey, here, us over here. Right. You know, so, you know, I am big on. <laughs> yeah. See the pause there. I'm big on keeping my garden tidy. Lord knows I've been trying literally three months to get things in order. But once I get things in order, I'm very particular about, you know, getting keeping things clean. You know, it's it's a formula for a healthier environment for the, the plants that you're growing. Now, I say these things and this is actually do as I say and not as I always do. I try. But there's going to be a time in the season where you're going to see some some tomato plants that don't look the best but guess what there's still ripe yeah. fruit on them there's going to be a time where i'm going to have my beloved collards and i'm going to say i let this leaf get you know twice as big as my head i really don't want yeah. them that big right you know um i do like big collard greens i like big collard greens that i cannot lie uh, so i mean don't get me wrong like we are all trying our best and and sometimes you get it right and other times you get it more right yeah <laughs> writer and then sometimes you don't you know so so I got two things to tell you. So first of all, um, we've talked about this on the show a lot about having a tidy garden and it is really important. Um, And I do envy you because your garden is way tighter than mine. I just feel like I'm always like got a project going on and there's like crap laying Mm -hmm. out. So um, real quick, my dad's for a couple months now, he's like, I'm coming to your house and I'm organizing your, your shed. Guess what he likes? That's like his hobby is like to create projects. Mm -hmm. So I was like, okay, fine. So I'm literally waiting for my father to come down here so he can organize my shed before I can get. That's why I have like plant pots everywhere and stuff. It's driving me crazy. But if you think about it, inside of all that clutter, things grow and manifest inside of it and can leach out into your garden. Now, I am a big believer in like, you've got to compartmentalize your projects and what you're doing. And like, I have Mm -hmm. weeds growing underneath my greenhouse into my greenhouse. I'm super aware of it. And I'm just letting it happen Mm -hmm. right now because it's like, I I don't have time to deal with that between everything else that's going on. So there is that. Now, I did learn something new since we're talking about pests and you brought up aphids. There is a type of honey that is almost greenish tint and apparently Mm -hmm. bees extract the juice from the aphids and turn it into honey and it's like one of the most sought after honeys isn't that interesting wow it's only a matter of time where that's what's created in my my garden there's a there's a reason why i have so many aphids there has to be this has to be the reason this is going to be now my calling wait i need a colony of bees yeah you need need a hive Yeah. Um, So one thing is like in my greenhouse this winter, I did a video and I set up, we've got aphids. I put it up and now the greenhouse is a very confined space and it's also Mm -hmm. a confined climate that time of year. Dude, within a day, they doubled. It's like exponential growth. Mm -hmm. And if you don't know what exponential means, it's basically it doubles every day. So you start with one, (laughs) two, four. And then, you know, you get 100, 200, 200, 400. Is that how doubling well, it's works? exponential okay. growth okay. is what that is. So, <laughs> but, you know, it can really get out of hand, like, extremely fast. So, 
you know, I went mm-hmm. out there, mm-hmm. took care of them, and it was like an uphill battle. It took me like a week to get them under control of constantly going out there, yeah. smushing them, treating them, just getting them under control because that's, you know, once you get one, they just start reproducing over and over and over. And so when you have all these plants and we are all, every single person listening to this podcast is guilty of this. We all overpack our gardens. Everybody plants. I am convinced because I know they say plant your uh, tomatoes and every two feet apart with four feet in between rows. I know I ain't doing that. I'd have one plant in the middle of a garden bed. I, um, I have one bed out of the 2,795 that I've done proper plant spacing with. How's that working out? And that's only a 36 inch <laughs> round bed. Um, so I told you, I'm doing pretty good with the, uh, the single stemming. Now there's one plant that I had to put another stake in place because clearly it's going to be a double stem and it has, you know, their flowers on the plant. So I ain't letting it go. But when I looked at, it, I said, I need to go back and look this up because even my single stem plants are spaced too close together. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Of course I would, you know? So the leaves are the leaves that are maintaining on the plant are stretching. Like there's another guy right yeah. here. Come on. What's the rule here? So, uh, so yeah, I mean, I think that that's, that's, Absolutely. It, their benefits of like closely planting, intensive planting, I think is what, what they call it. Uh, but they're definitely it's opportunity for some of what we're seeing. It's opportunity for pests yep. to hide. It could delay you seeing that they're a pest. I moved. Um, I have this thing where I do this in general. If something is in, not in its place, but it's in a memorable place, I'll leave it there because I need to. Now I remember it being there. It's a whole thing. Right. And so if I put it away. Again, I may not remember if I take the stuff into the garage, I'll be sifting around the garage. But as soon as I need this spade, I know that it's in a pot in the corner of the mm-hmm. front yard garden. So I leave it there. Right. So I had this um, this bag of leaves. I planted out some things. No, no. I covered the bed originally earlier in the spring with leaves, shredded leaves, you know, so practice. And so now I'm ready to plant because I've had so much roly poly peel bug. Uh, pressure. I know that once I plant, if I leave these leaves here and I start to water, it's going to be a breeding ground for them. So I remove a bunch of the leaves, put them in a ba- black plastic bag. I know I'm going to use them again in the garden. I leave the bag like it's kind of sitting on some wood chips. It's kind of sitting on like a paver, but it's out like in the corner. And so I was working in that area this weekend and I moved the bag. You want to talk about a whole like neighborhood of roly polies. They're like, hey, hey, who turned the good. lights on? You know, and so this is a good example of there's no re- I actually was moving it because I was trying to tidy up. Right. And I, I've basically been hosting these roly polies for weeks now. You know, it's small things like that. Um, I know I have a problem in my garden and I am actually doing things to enable the problem, further the problem. Those are things that you have to keep conscious of as yeah, a gardener. But I mean, the second you remove that bag and you lift it up and you see those roly polies, if you get rid of them, you've now taken that and made a move, a step in the right direction. You like this segue. Yep. Stump, you like stump, this segue, stump. don't you, yep. everybody? So mm, <laughs> here's the I point. Did. In which you've made it 40 minutes, and we're going to tell you how to treat for these. Um, do you mind if I do this, Batavia? No, because of course not. you don't really treat often. I'm still, I'm still pouting about the whole episode because I'm still pouting about the gift that we're given to be able to grow food. And then all of a sudden, pests want to come in and intervene. Yeah. So, break it down like this. Now, if you've listened to the spring episode about pests, then you know that like caterpillars... Um, and so we'll just say, because Batavia is dealing with them, the cabbage looper, um, even I would venture to say, I don't know this for a fact, but your tomato hornworm, if you don't want to pick it up, um, cucumber worms, I don't know the technical term for them. You know what I'm talking about, right? Um, Mm -hmm. anything like that, even the squash vine borer, if you're diligent enough, BT works, BT attacks it, it eats it, and then it basically rots its stomach out. And so it'll mm-hmm. die off and then come back, do it again, seven to 10 la- days later, the new eggs have hatched. And if you've missed some, you do it again and you should be under control. So you can do that. Now, that being said, for something like the tomato hornworm, just pick it up, 
put you a set of gloves on and pick it up and remove it. It's just better off that way because there's no need. I don't. I'm all about spraying, but I'm all about spraying when you have to spray. You know, you got to be realistic. Mm-hmm. Um, hard cap. Uh, the tomato hornworm is probably the creepiest, yeah. freakiest. And it probably is just by luck. Like I've seen, I saw pictures on it before I saw it in my garden to completely freaked out. And they, the damage they do is so quick. It's very quick. But if you see one in your garden, it's got the white sacks hanging off of it. Don't leave it. Leave it. Oh yeah. Because that's actually a, leave Leave that that. worm. Do not touch it because that is actually a parasitic wasp that is eating the worm from the inside out. And when they hatch, they will continue to do so. So this is where like that little bit of knowledge right there can help with your problem o- overall in time. You know, it may do a little bit of damage. Yeah, we must have. We must have talked about it on the show, so I didn't. So when I said don't leave it like before the wasp or the, the eggs uh, come, don't like see it in the morning and go nope. off to work and say, I'll get it in that. No, don't do it. Right. Um we must have talked about it on the episode because that's not something I would have just come across in my random garden garden reading. But I came and I saw like I missed one, the um, tomato hornworm, and I saw the eggs. I knew immediately like, all right, the time has come. Leave it. Right. Even freakier than the regular to- tomato hornworm. Um Oh, I've had what army worms, army worms too. Gosh, see, this is the reason you keep on, and they drill down into yep. the fruit. You keep on bringing up the this pest episode, and then I'm reminded of all of the the pests that are going to be in my garden in a matter of three, two. Yeah, one. but I mean, the BT will take care of the army worms. You know, it takes mm-hmm. care of all mm-hmm. of that. So, yeah, it's a wide it's a wide spread, and it doesn't hurt your pollinators. That's the thing is it's targeted to this whole thing. They've and I know you I mean mm-hmm. they've done studies on it. So neem oil is very good, and it basically hits all of your um, hard bodied insects for the most part. A lot of the same way that the BT does, where it basically first of all it leaves the the plant unappetized un. It tastes bad to them. I can't think of the term. Mm -hmm. It tastes bad to them. So that's like step one. But then it also will attack their nervous system. And that's a naturally occurring seed. Now, they have done studies that say it does not affect bees and stuff like that. But then there's newer studies that say it could affect them. So Mm -hmm. we just want to be very careful about when to apply these. And so you want to apply them when your pollinators are not. Because, I mean, how often do you see a bee out in the evening doing its work you know they're usually going back to their hives or homes or whatever but you'll still see these all out so squash bugs japanese beetles uh flea beetles it works really good on um help me just call out some and i'll tell you if i've seen it work or not um so grasshoppers are a really bad one in my area and it actually does not Mm -hmm. work very well with those um hand picking them is very difficult so i play a game I get my pruners and I sneak up behind them and I cut them in half and that works. But they, and I mean, it doesn't hurt to try, but generally speaking, I don't see it really making an effect on them. So be careful with that. But, you know, using these together, once you see a problem and you use, you attack them, then it helps. Now you've got to mix the concentrations, right? That's why I buy it concentrated. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I get a little bottle of BT and it's like 15 bucks for, I think, eight ounces, maybe 10 ounces, but it's one teaspoon per gallon. So I can usually make that bottle last throughout the entire year of me growing because I grow year mm-hmm. round. So there is that. And then mixing the dish soap in with it will help with that. Now, it doesn't do anything for the caterpillar, so there's no need to even do that, you know, in your soft bodied insects. So these little. S- you're still at neem yeah, oil, at, or did you I go just back kind of went to BT yeah. with the oil, and then the last one that I would yeah. bring up would be pyrethrin, which will kill everything. It's organic, but it's like a nuclear organic bomb. So once you mm-hmm. spray it, everything, good and bad, will die. So think about it before you use it. I've got a bottle of it. I'm, I haven't used it. I don't plan on using it, but it's there if I need it. So. You know, that's yeah. another one. You can get all this stuff is pretty cheap. I, uh, excuse me. And um, while I typically don't do it, I'm not opposed to if I feel like you've got, you've, uh, you're away for a week or two weeks or something and you come back 
and you know there's so much damage you need to get it under control i was chatting with a gardener last week last week last year and the same thing occurred you know sent me pictures of it and i said okay you know like this is these are some options and i think she came back like a week later it's like i went and bought this spray you know i basically she felt like she needed to like begin the healing more uh more rapidly and i get it right you know a lot of us again have shorter seasons and even if you don't have a short season a lot of us aren't growing everything 365 days a year the key is not everything and that means that there is a season for the thing you're growing you know and so i I definitely understand and respect the idea of you wanting to get that thing during that time um so so i get it i think um you know, I've bought a number of things over the years and used some of them, decided not to use others. The biggest advice I could give is, and I ignore so many instructions on so many things, but read the instructions and follow yeah. them, right? That's going to be your best chance. Uh, there's some notes that generally, if it's not on the bottle, it may, you know, some a couple of Google searches would be, you know, they say you can spray and then consume from that plant up to x number of days before harvest there are a couple that may even say same day but make sure you understand that as well um so so yeah man you know i i totally yeah. get it now psa public service announcement for everybody um okay. biggest thing you can do is learn how to identify the pest yourself because if you have a problem and you go on social media and you post a picture of it and say, what is this eating my plant? Help, help. By the time you get an answer, it's already doubled. Okay? Because more than likely, the picture you're putting up is not is not good enough to identify the pest. And so the best thing you can do is research it out yourself and get to know your pests that are in your area. Because somebody in Florida could say something and it's not even a pest here. And then you get confused. So figure out your pests and start to treat them. Now, I use three things. Well, really two things in my garden, BT and neem. And I grow throughout. So, you know, it is possible. And there's concoctions of all kinds of stuff you can use. Um like D- Dale's dead bug juice and stuff like that you can use. Um, I've even read that you can even mix neem and BT together and do like an all-in-one spray. I don't like to do that, but that is a possibility from what I understand. So you can try that, but research that stuff out and um, don't rely on other people because by the time you get the answer, it's too late. The um, consideration, right? You know, so even with Ben and, and my garden, we generally we share some of the same pests, mm-hmm. right? But there's some things that his his garden harder than mine, and vice versa. We are really growing in two different climates. Um, so you know when you hear about someone experiencing problems with X, you know just don't discount no. it. You know you may see the same issue, but it may not run rampant. Um, uh, leaf miners. I've gotten this question at least twice a year over the last few years. I see leaf miners on leaves every year but i could count on one hand the plants that i see it on the number of leaves so it's not something that runs rampant in my garden but i i get when people have like you know plants covered in them i get it you know what i'm saying um so just a little consideration for what your trouble is today may not you know or yeah what their problem is today may not be yours but your day is coming and no, also I don't, I don't. for the record i've never had a leaf miner so i mean that right there tells you you know i've read about them but i've never seen one in my garden so that picture i mean i could tell you what it is but other than that like i haven't tried anything so i don't fill my brain with that knowledge until it's time so um that's kind of that's another thing that cover could help with (laughs) i'm sure there's a spray associated with it i basically every time i see it i pick that leaf off Um, and discard it so that being said i do want to make uh one request and then i want to get to the listener question that was left for us um the first request is we're closing in on a million downloads everybody we're getting closer by the day so if you could find a gardener and share the show that's all put it on your social media whatever Pick an episode and share it. Let's try and get to that 1 million mark. I just, I don't know. 1 million sounds like a lot. So um, now, as far as the question goes, you ready? 
Mm-hmm. This one could be long and it could be short, however you want to answer it. Mm. So the Atkinsons on Spotify wrote, would you guys be interested in addressing pruning tomato plants? I've noticed very mm. popular camps on this topic. <laughs> so, um, go ahead. Say what you got to say. Well, I just wish... Um, say hi, the Atkinsons. I wish that this was a question at the top of the, sh- the show, so the show could have gone into know, a whole different direction. Uh, so, uh, I prune my tomato plants. Even my determinants, but there's different levels okay. of pruning. So, from the soil line or your mulch to, I'm going to call it about a foot. Most of my tomato plants are bare, just Mm -hmm. stem there. So, I start with that level of pruning, which includes my cherry tomatoes and my determinants. My determinants, and I'll toss the mic over to you here. My determinants, I very much limit the rest of the pruning I do. I will prune leaves in particular if there's like a lot of crisscrossing you know, or they're really hanging low or something. But I try to let that plant do the thing it's going to do. And it's going to, you know, basically sit here to produce a certain amount. Um, But I have, I have mixed feelings on um, pruning and production. So I'm going to toss it over to you. Okay. Um, Thank you for handing it off, Batavia. It's very nice of you. Um, No, for me, it's determinants. I'm the same way for the most part. I prune them. Airflow underneath is really important. And then Mm -hmm. I'll prune if they're like growing into each other. Um, Indeterminants. It's very popular to single stem. And I'm curious about the popular camps. That's what kind of caught my eye on this. I don't know the different camps Mm -hmm. on this. Um, I know that as far as that goes, single stem stemming versus non. So I don't prune. Let's go with determinants. I prune my determinants foot up. If they're touching, crisscrossing, like Batavia said, just anything to create airflow, very minimal, and I do it all at once. So I don't go out there every single day and do it because basically what you're doing is you're creating a wound and then the plant needs to recover. Mm -hmm. And I do it early in the growth cycle. So once they start putting on green tomatoes, I'll come out and I'll prune them, let it go. But you don't want to prune them all the time. Um, Indeterminates, though, when it comes to single stemming, I'm on the fence about that as well. I know that they say if you single stem, which is when you remove all the suckers and you basically have one stem going up, the plant will focus more on growing fruits and less on growing leaves and stems and shoots and stuff like that. I like to take a measured approach and prune most of the suckers, but not all of them. So I typically don't prune suckers. Yeah. Period. Right. In the years I've been growing tomatoes this year, this is the the most effort I've given to single stemming. And it's in part because I had so many starts of different varieties and because we're not growing um, tomatoes in the cage, maybe this year, the original, well, cage, maybe 2.0. Um, I had to be, get a little bit more creative. And so I said, okay, this is the year for single stemming. I feel like maybe I have the time for it. Um, and so I've already let a couple get away from me, but I'm doing a pretty good job. And the thing I've read about it and seen videos on is I have two pineapple tomato plants, one that I'm going to prune. They're both indeterminate, of course. Well, they're the same plant so so if one's indeterminate the other one's indeterminate anyway um so i'm growing one in the natural way where i naturally prune it you know bottom you know leaves and then maybe a few leaves in between leaving suckers in place and then i have it sitting right next to one that i'm single stemming that's the one that has a double branch but that's beside the point so the thing i've read is i should expect larger tomatoes from the single stem but fewer total from the plant that I'm single stemming. So total production will be fewer. If I do this the way that I plan on doing this, I will have facts for this particular variety in my growing area, right? To share at the end of the season, because I want to see, you know, weight, total number of tomatoes from the regular one, you know, versus the one that's going to be single-ish stemmed. Um, It's interesting. It's, you know, to be quite frank, 
the benefit of having larger tomatoes is appealing to me. Um, and, but really the benefit of being able to play around with multiple um, varieties in maybe a limited amount of space is probably the bigger win for me. Cause otherwise it's a lot of work that you're signing up for. Yeah. Right. Throughout the season, you're picking off, cutting off, pinching off these suckers. Um, if it's not going to get the thing that you want out of it. I think that's where it comes down to. And to be frank, it took me a while to figure out what I wanted out of these plants and which method to use. And that may change in the years yeah. to come. Yeah. We'll you, we always reserve the right to change our methods. I will say that if you <laughs> prune suckers off of a determinant plant above that initial you know, six inches to one foot off the soil line, you might as well rip the plant up and throw it away. Because you're not going to get the production that is possible because a determinant is going to produce a big flush and then it's going to stop. Mm-hmm. So don't trim the suckers off of that. And then as far as that goes, um, you know, with the indeterminants, I mean, it's I think it's due just like what Batavia is doing with them. You know, trim it. Don't trim one don't trim one see what happens i mean what what do you want do you want more tomatoes or do you want fewer big tomatoes i mean and how much bigger are the tomatoes really going to be that's the other question you know there's so many stu- yeah. things that i've seen where people will single stem all of their plants and be like see it's great but the question i have is what would that produce if you had three or four branches coming off of it you know versus and i get having not having 10 to 15 but also space saving is a big important part as well yeah space saving is huge uh no pun intended um and there's also this bit which i don't normally see folks talk about but that plant has less protection too when you're single stemming Right. It's a little bit more vulnerable, generally speaking. You do hear some people say, like, be conscious of the leaves that you may prune. You can single stem without pruning leaves. Right. Um, Because there some tomatoes in some areas may uh, experience some sun scald, you know, because, again, they don't have as much protection. But even beyond the tomato itself, it's. I believe it's easier to rebound if I'm fluffier, (laughs) if something attacks me compared to if I've like, you know, skinny this thing down to one stem. So I don't see people talk about, you know, difficulties in that way. I can't imagine it's not been their experience. I think it's just not maybe a popular thing to talk about. I could be wrong. Again, this is we're like two what's this month and a half into my plants and this is the longest i've ever gone with my single stemming attempt so by no means am i an expert and i really want to go through this process in part to see if it's something i really do yeah. like do i want to dedicate this time and take this approach I, I it's hard for me to believe that i do this with every plant but you never know Yeah, i mean it just it, it's one of those things where you form a habit you go out every day and you check it and mm-hmm. you pull them before they're easy now remember mm-hmm. if you're single stemming you're doing wounds every single day Every day. Imagine if every day you cut yourself, vulnerable. every single yeah. day you had a knife and you cut your arm, mm-hmm. how would you feel? So just remember that. And I, I don't know the correct answer to that question. I know that basically, like the question said, there's different camps, but I can tell you that is the most important part of it is knowing if you're growing a determinant or an indeterminant tomato. And that is going to dictate what you can and cannot do for it. So... You know, one quick, one other quick note, I, and this may be, this may not be worth the acknowledgement, but so people that are in even shorter seasons than I am or you are, um, so the idea of single stemming, you should get to, um, you know, mature fruit faster, right? You know, so I wonder how much it helps if you, again, have a shorter growing season. Remember every year that I planted tomato plants i was pulling off and i still do pull off green tomatoes besides last year green tomatoes in october you know so again you know if i keep my plants healthy indeterminates will produce until either cold kills them or disease right Um, but if you are struggling with getting to ripe fruit i wonder if single stemming could be a path because again energy is going into producing less fruit but ripening that fruit up something to think about yeah I'm not going to give that much more thought about it. To I be mean, quite if you frank. really want to think about it, if you really want to know the answer, find out what farmers do when they grow indeterminate tomatoes. That's going to give you the ultimate answer. I bet they don't single stem their tomatoes. 
Yeah, I hear you. But then there, there's a lot of like new age farmers that probably do. But there's also this bit of like it's a whole production, you know, versus you and your garden, you know, with some help from your kid every now and again. You know what I'm saying? So, so there's that bit. Yeah, but I mean, it just kind of gives you an idea. Like they wouldn't do one way if it didn't give them the most production. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So I've never even seen a tomato farm. So there's that. They got to come from somewhere, right? Bucket list. Yeah, I don't know. I've seen all the strawberry <laughs> farms, though. We've covered that. <laughs> I have some strawberries to harvest. I wonder if it's a yeah, pint. Yeah, I doubt it. <laughs> so, um, yeah, if you'd like to be like the Atkinsons and leave us a message to answer, you can do it on Spotify. On every episode, it'll come up. And then also, you can do it through Patreon if you feel like being a supporter. And you can also support us through Apple subscriptions or on our Facebook page, which is Backyard Gardens Community Gardens. There you Garden. go. So feel free to join us. And until next. <laughs> oh, wait. <laughs> next... A premature <laughs> fail. Sorry. And until next time, everybody, <laughs> learn to grow and grow for change. See ya. And use that bell from a few seconds ago. No, okay. Here you go. <laughs> Now you know why people feel like celebrating at harvest time. All over the world, people have feasting and good times when the crops have been gathered in. Hey, everybody. Thanks for checking out the Backyard Gardens podcast. If you like what we're doing and you want to continue to support the podcast, head over to our Patreon page to sign up. You can also make a one-time donation using PayPal. Both of these links are in the description. With your support, we can continue growing and helping others in their gardens. See ya. If you guys want some Backyard Gardens gear, go to the link below and check out our t-shirts, mugs, pint glasses, and other gear. All purchases go towards helping to support the show, so thank you so much in advance, and we hope you enjoy. We want everybody to have a garden, and we're going to give you a chance to win free seeds every month. Head over to BackyardGardensTV.com and enter your email address to be entered in all of our giveaways. Good luck! We want you to be a part of our gardening community. DM us a picture of your garden at Backyard Gardens TV on Instagram, and we will share it with our listeners.